I'm giving a bit of a different talk, and I'm afraid that it's going to, it should actually, it's not designed to, but it will depress you. It's a talk about the sexual abuse crisis in the church and the connection between humanae vitae and this crisis in the church. I think we need to come to a much uh, deeper understanding of it, and I think this is one of the ways to do it. Uh, humanae vitae came out in 1968, and it was, the church has never been the same since Humanae Vitae came out in 1968. It really determined the course of the church because there was such dissent from the teaching of Humanae Vitae, which made dissent run through all of um, church teaching. I have a marvelous story about um, bishops, archbishops, cardinal, eventually Cardinal Stafford, uh, who was a young man when Humanae Vitae came out, a young priest, and he was asked to come to a priest meeting of priests who had never read Humanae Vitae, had just come out, and he was asked to sign a statement of dissent. They'd not, he'd not read it, no one in the room had read it. Uh, he refused to sign it, right? But he said from that moment on, he said the priesthood was a changed uh, reality. Before that, if a priest saw another man with a collar, he knew he was his comrade in arms. They were fighting the same fight in the world for Jesus Christ and Jesus' kingdom. But after Humanae Vitae, when dissent came, when you had some priests who didn't accept Humanae Vitae and other priests who did, you were wary of other priests. Are we on the same team or not? And that has not changed, right? That has not changed. I think it's gotten a little better, but I hope, I don't know. Pope Paul VI uh, wrote Humanae Vitae in 1968 in the face, uh, even then, of great uh, turmoil. He had put together a special commission or expanded a commission by set up by uh, John the 23rd to explore how the church could change, how it should teach its teaching in the modern world that people thought was vastly overpopulated. And uh, that commission decided in the course of its work that the church um, could and should change its teaching, right? And that information was leaked uh, to the media and the whole world was waiting for Pope Paul VI to, to uh, get up to speed. Uh, with the rest of the world on the question of, of contraception. He wrote uh, Humanae Vitae under, uh, after much agonizing soul searching and consulting and he basically, as Robert said, he said, I, I can't change it. This is God's, no law, God's law, not man's law. I couldn't change it if I wanted to. He didn't want to, but he couldn't change it if he wanted to. The fact is that the two major theologians in the world, Bernard Herring, who Robert mentioned, and Joseph Fuchs, a Jesuit, were both dissenters from Humanae Vitae. They were the major uh, theologians in the world. They had taught the major theologians in the world who were teaching at universities and seminaries. So their dissent from Humanae Vitae spread rapidly around the world because the best of the best had studied in Rome, had studied under them, even when they studied elsewhere. They studied Bernard Herring, they studied Joseph Fuchs. And so dissent became absolutely the coin of the realm. Almost every seminary uh, was staffed by uh, moral theologians who dissented from Humanae Vitae. Priests were told they should not teach the church's teaching. Uh, if couples confessed it in the seminary, they should be told that they were free to call, follow their consciences on this. Right? And so, I mean, I was a teacher at Notre Dame in the 80s, and I was a supporter of Humanae Vitae, and there were like a handful of us. You could sit around one table here uh, at the most. And we were really considered to be retrograde, people who simply could not uh, get up with the times uh, where the church was at the present. Uh, bishop conferences around the world were asked to write statements of support of Humanae Vitae. And instead, many of them, um, put out statements or definitely not supportive. And what they claimed was is that uh, it was simply a matter of conscience, that people could follow their consciences. I can give a whole talk on that, but the conscience clause, that conscience clause, always appeared in textbooks in respect to contraception, not to um, racism, not to uh, murder. If you in good conscience think you can murder, it's okay to murder. <laughs> that was never the case. It was only on sexual matters. And also since there might be a conflict of duties in spouses to have sexual intercourse or to be open to procreation. And I think Robert's uh, story of his own wife and himself early in their marriage that realized that um, love requires sometimes abstinence and it is loving to abstain. And that um, the being openness, open to procreation again is, is loving. 
Father Charles Curran stood on the steps of uh, Catholic University of America and announced that Catholics uh, did not need to abide by this teaching. He was a young popular uh, priest at CUA and he told the public, the Catholic lady, that this was based on an inadequate notion of natural law and spouses could do what they thought their consciences dictated. It's been amazing, he must seem, maybe, I don't know if he's frail now, he's not that much older than I am, but we haven't seen him on TV. He used to be on t TV constantly. Whenever there was someone, they wanted someone who would um, comment on church activities that always went to uh, Father Curran. Cardinal O'Boyle was the cardinal in Washington, D.C. When Humanivite came out, 150 priests uh, signed a, a, a petition against Humanivite and he suspended some of their faculties. They appealed to Rome, and Rome uh, went with the, the priests rather than with a boil and asked him to restore their faculties. And you might say, why? Why did they do that? They were afraid of schism in the church. They were afraid that the church would split, that there would be, in fact, when I was at Notre Dame, uh, there was much talk of a schism, that there should be an American Catholic church and a Roman Catholic church and it wouldn't be under the juridical control of the Roman Catholic Church. Now there's talk of a German Catholic Church. Sometimes there's a talk in Germany of, of, of a schism. You'll notice in the last 50 years, uh, most of us have heard almost nothing about Humanae Vitae from the pulpit or actually any moral teaching, right? Dissent, oh, there, okay, well, this. So Humanae Vitae, the church has not recovered from 1968. It's, get, it's gotten better though it quickly has gotten a little bit worse. But for the last, um, since the catechism and since Veritatis Splendor, since the reform of the seminaries in the early um, part of this century, things have gotten quite a bit better, right? And there was reason to be optimistic. But the consequences of dissenting from Humanae Vitae are much deeper and more serious than most of us had any idea. And that really, uh, again, we, we now have, we've had dissent from Humanae Vitae and doctoral disarray for the last 50 years that we've been recovered them from somewhat. Now I'll skip that frame. And I'm, I want to claim that we're at the same kind of pivotal point in the church in 2018 that we were in 1968. Meaning that the church will never be the same. Uh, and that in one way, that's a good thing. <laughs> it might be absolutely a good thing if we get it right, right? Because we're living at a time where we have discovered or at least we're willing to admit now, it's come to light, the incredible uh, sex abuse that has gone on in the church for decades and decades and decades, right? And it's not just minors, right, which is horrible, but the law is taking care of that, and it's too bad we had to depend upon the law to do it, right? But we have other problems in the church, and this is an article in Slate magazine, right? This is a not a non-Catholic, non it's not sort of a bunch of right-wingers who are trying to get the church, or, but it's the articles about the, how the Catholic priesthood became an unlikely haven for many gay men, right? And we have a problem in the Catholic Church, which is men who violate their vows of celibacy, both those who are homosexual and heterosexual, right? But the bigger problem is the homosexual um, acting out, uh, because it really, they, 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 it's, it's sometimes called the gay mafia and the lavender lobby and this sort of thing. But they have a way of protecting themselves and advancing each other. And that's what we have in the church. If this is news to you, <laughs> I'm sorry to shock you like this. I know it's traumatizing. It's been traumatizing for me, and, and I've known it for a long time. I've known it for a long time. But I know grown men who aren't sleeping well at night because it's our church, and we love our church, and we love our priests. Right? And this is not at all meant to be against men who um, experience same-sex attraction and live chaste lives. Those men are heroes in my mind. Right? I'd give them some great reward, award if I could. Right? But it's those who are active. So this article asks the question, how many gay priests actually exist? It says most surveys, which due to sensitivity of the subject, admittedly suffer from limited samples and other design issues, find between 15% and 50% of U.S. priests are gay, which is much greater than the 3.8% of people who identify as LGBTQ, right? It says, in the last half century, there's also been an increased gaying of the priesthood in the West. Throughout the 1970s, several hundred men left the priesthood each year, many of them for marriage. In the 70s, there was a, 
the departure of um, heterosexual men from the priesthood. They wanted to enjoy, it, it was very much, I'll show in a minute, but it was an, an, a different view of the purpose of sex. If sex is just for pleasure and not for raising a family, then um, what was celibacy all about? Right? What was celibacy all about? Sex is just for pleasure. We, it, we had the sense that you had to have sex. You couldn't live without sex. That's why contraception was important. You couldn't abstain. You had to have it. You weren't happy unless you were having sex. And the priest thought, well, I thought I was, but I guess I'm not. And so they went to taste what the world had to offer. It said, um, a straight priest left the church for domestic bliss. The proportion of remaining priests who were gay grew. Again, they, they, they recruited each other and they promoted each other. That's the 70s and 80s, well into the 90s. In a survey of several thousand priests in the US, the Los Angeles Times found that 28% of priests between the ages of 46 and 55 reported they were gay. This was, statistic was higher than the percentages found in other age brackets and reflected the outflow of straight, straight priests throughout the 70s and 80s. The high number of gay priests also became evident in the 1980s when the priesthood was hit hard by the AIDS crisis that was afflicting the gay community. I remember an article in National Catholic Reporter in the 80s that was asking about whether religious orders should accept um, homosexual m men to the priesthood and to their orders. They said no, because we're all being, already being bankrupted by medical costs for men who have uh, AIDS. It says the Kansas City Star estimated that at least 300 U.S. priests suffer from AIDS-related deaths between the mid-1980s and 1999. The Star concluded that priests were about twice as likely as other adult men to die from AIDS. Now, you've been following the story, I think, of, of um, McCarrick, right? It's one of the best things that's happened to this church, I hate to tell you. But the McCarrick scandal is one of the best things that's happened to this church because it's making us take a close look at what happened. You know, and, and I want to call him a gray, gay priest Harvey Weinstein is, is who he is. So he's a predator who, predator who preyed upon young men. And I hate to tell you how much, it's not just on children, it's not just on prepubescent children, but it's on um, teenage boys and it's on adult men and women that this predation happens. So what's the connection between descent from humanae vitae and the sex abuse problem? Again, there's a distorted view of sex. Sex is needed uh, at, at, after humanae vitae. Sex needed to have nothing to do with procreation or commitment. Sex was viewed as being essential to human happiness. No one can be expected to go without it. That's our culture now. No one can be expected to go without it. Heterosexual priests left in the hundreds. Homosexual individuals flooded in. It was a good place to hide. In the 70s, it still wasn't respectable to be out as gay. And so the priesthood was a great place for men who didn't want to didn't want to get married. They wanted prestige. They wanted a guaranteed job and a house and a cars and vacations and education and lots of respect. And the priesthood was a great place to go. All right, lots of respect, easy, secure life. So most people are focused on McCarrick. Who knew and didn't report what happened with the reports? I want to know which bishops continued to send young men to seminaries under the direction of McCarrick. Those who knew about it, why did they send their, their seminarians to uh, his seminary? P some people are, are focused on the possible sexual abuse by bishops that's been protected by the bishops. It's focused on minors and on the future. Donardo has set up a commission involving laity, but if Rome doesn't cooperate, which it looks like it's beginning to cooperate, it may happen. But what about bishops who currently now are active homosexuals? There are such men, I'm sorry to tell you, right? The highest estimates, I think, go up to 30%. I have no idea what the right number is. I have no idea, all right? In the US, we had Weakland and McCarrick. We had Marcial, Marcial Legionaries in Ireland at Archbishop McGee. Now, the situation in, in dioceses, some are governed by active homosexual bishops. It's safe to say they'll uncooperative, un, be uncooperative with any cleanup campaign. As I said, it might be 30% or more. Presbyterates have from 5% to 60% of active homosexuals and heterosexuals violating their vows. And almost all bishops have been complicit in some way. They have looked the other way. Most bishops have inherited a mess. Inherit, they didn't make the mess, they inherited a mess. And there's many good bishops who, when they get into uh, um, 
their diocese. They have to pay a lot for child abuse cases. They have to close schools. They have to put churches together. They have to do what they can to try to bring orthodoxy back to the schools and teaching, etc. It's a hard, hard job, right? And they have a, a gang, if you will, of homosexual priests who I've heard several priests tell, I mean, I've heard of several bishops who um, up, become, up, upon becoming bishops, they, a group of the active homosexual priests met with them and told them that if they didn't leave them alone, they would resign and they would take sometimes up to half of the presbyterate with them, right? So the bishops just looked the other way, right? Because who wants to lose half their presbyterate? They hold a disproportionate number of influential posts. They appoint their friends to the best assignments. They persecute and harass generally orthodox priests. They oppose or impede the efforts of priests and laity who wish to implement programs promoting faithful Catholicism. They create an atmosphere where preaching on controversial issues simply is not done. Many of you know this to be true. For some of you, it's a shock, <laughs> all right? I'm sorry, all right? All right, I'm gonna skip this. They're not necessarily organized. These are, there's some formal or informal organizations. Again, they, they are informally organized and they have a great a degree of control, all right. How did this happen? There's some speculation that there was actually an infiltration by communists in the 30s and 40s and 50s, right? You look up the woman, look up the name Bella Dodd, right? She genuinely was a communist. There's no question about it. That's well established. Um, she was converted to Catholicism under um, Fulton Sheen, right? And she told Alice von Hildebrand, and Alice von Hildebrand has a video on um, YouTube, where she tells about meeting with Bella Dodd, and Bella Dodd said she was responsible for putting some 1,000 or 1,200 priests, men into the priesthood, right? The evidence, that's the evidence we have, uh, besides the fact that we have a corrupt priesthood. And the communists were well known for trying to ruin the Catholic Church and to ruin it by attacking the family and promoting sexual license, okay? There was, for a very long time, corruption in the seminaries. Detroit was one of the worst, right? Um, in the 80s and 90s, it was very hard for a man who was heterosexual to get safely through the seminary, right? They were recruiting, um, recruiting homosexuals. There was a group, and when, when men became uh, ordained, uh, older priests would groom the younger priests uh, to be in homosexual relationships. Many of them went through seminary and were groomed themselves. The Buffalo Seminary is now going through a huge um, turmoil. Right? And a friend of mine who worked in the Chancery Office in uh, Buffalo for 17 years, many years ago, said that Buffalo was, uh, was a pink palace, as they call these places, that they called seminaries that were this way. And she said the vocation director was a very, um, active homosexual, the vocation director. And he had his way with the young men in the minor seminary, right? Boys who were uh, 13, 14, and 15. So they were abused by a priest when they were 13, 14, and 15. And those men became priests. And some of them have become bishops, right? So they pass on the abuse that they received when they were young. And of course, descent from humani vitae. I'm so just a little bit here in a minute. What's our evidence for this? What's our evidence for what we're seeing? For years, such publication as the Wander and Fidelity magazine gave very good reports about it. I read them. I read them in the 80s. I actually believed them, but I didn't think anything could be done about it. Right? I didn't think, but a lot of people said, we're not gonna read that stuff. It's too unpleasant, it's sensationalist, it's who, who wants to even think about it, all right? Again, it was unheeded because there was some unbalanced reporting. There were exposés books which are actually extremely good. Rich, Richard Seip and Thomas Doyle wrote Sex, Priests, and Sacred Codes, uh, originally in 1994, and updated it in 2016. They warned the bishops, they warned everybody what was going on, on very good data, all right? Book by Jason Berry, Lead Us Not Into Temptation. Again, written at first in 1992. There's a little bit on YouTube of a Phil Donahue show with Jason Berry and Andrew Greeley. Andrew Greeley was a priest novelist in Chicago. And Jason Berry said in 1993, he said, not, he said this in 1993, but he said, after Humani Vitae, 
there was an influx, he said, of homosexuals into the priesthood. And Andrew Greeley wrote about it uh, in a novelistic fashion about what was going on in Chicago. Right? Donald Cousins was a priest and a rector of a seminary. He wrote about it, the changing face of the priesthood, talked about the priesthood becoming a gay profession. Leon Pottles wrote an incredible book. He was an FBI agent who did amazing studies. There's a wonderful interview with him by Patrick Coffin on the internet. Patrick Coffin interviewing Leon Pottles. And Leon Pottles said in, 19, in 2003, he sent a copies of his book to every bishop in the United States and did not get an acknowledgement from a single one of them of what he wrote. We knew, right, we knew. But we thought the bishops were gonna do something about it. We thought this can't last, it's out there, they must be doing something. Current sources of virtually every Catholic publication on the web, plus blogs, radio shows, and TV. You should all follow me, or, or yeah, follow me on Facebook. I post all this stuff. It's depressing, but it's, it's all there. Um, Rod Dreher is an incredible columnist. He uh, blogs on the American Conservative. Amazing stuff. Life Life News. There's a 19, no, 2002, 2006, nine something. Just look up the Gawker and look up Miami. And the stories of the abuse in the Diocese of Miami, unbelievable, unbelievable, all right? There are dedicated sites such as complicit, complicitclergy.com, bishopsaccountability.org. SNAP has been fighting it for a long time. All right, I'm not going to read all of this. I'm running out of time. This is, these are some stories about, um, again, homosexuality in the priesthood. This young man wanted to be a Jesuit. Uh, he was preyed upon by other Jesuits, uh, encouraged by his spiritual director to have sex with a, a priest who was um, in love with him because it'd be kind of exotic and cool. Um, and he left the Jesuits because he had become very thoroughly homosexual, he more or less was before he went in. But he felt that he couldn't be as public about it as he wanted to be, all right? Um, different numbers. This is amazing. This is a 1980 study. It said the number of sex partners for this sample that they did ranged from 500 or more for 11 of the participants of the study to fewer than 10 for nine participants than an average of 227, these are priests. And when asked, most of them said they would take again a vow of celibacy. Mm. Okay, there's some great films about the abuse crisis, Spotlight, Calvary, Doubt. There's some new Polish film you can find, and if you got the stomach for it, Candelabra. It's not about the priest crisis, but it is about Liberace and about grooming a young man. All right, why have the bishops not act? Some few have. Uh, there may be many others that I don't know of, but certainly Bishop Olmsted and Bishop Olson in Texas have done an amazing job. Again, they've inherited a culture that holds that a man's life is his private life, and a good confession is sufficient to remedy the situation. All right, I am going to, seminaries have been much reformed. All right, this is, what I have many proposals. Other people have proposals. There's lots of good proposals out there that it's gonna take a lot of time, a lot of effort, need a lot of support. But I think the first thing to do is that the bishops have to dedicate their presbyterates to learning how to achieve a deep intimacy with Jesus, right? And they have to commit themselves to living a life of chaste celibacy. This is from that, this book. I wanted to talk about that book, In Sinu Yezo. This is a Benedictine priest who in, mm, I think two th about 10 years ago, um, was receiving locutions from Jesus, all right? And he said the most amazing things to, Jesus, to, to this priest. He said things, I'm about to renew the priesthood of my church in holiness. I'm very close to cleansing my priests of the impurities that defile them. Soon, very soon, I will pour out my graces of spiritual healing upon all my priests. I will separate those who will accept the gift of my divine friendship from those who will harden their hearts against me. Um, to the first, I will give a radiant holiness like that of John and of my apostles in the beginning. From the others, I will take away even what they think they have. So Jesus, in, about 10 years ago, said, I am going to purify my church. And those priests who don't want to be all in, all in, uh, living chaste celibacy, they need to go, right? And the others I will support. He says, I want the priests of my church clean in heart and faithful in responding to the immense love with which I have loved each one of them and chosen each one for myself 
and for the realization of the des designs of my heart. Those who do not live in my friendship betray me and impede my work. They detract from the beauty of holiness that I would see shine in my church. This is what the book suggests, Jesus suggests, that priests meet on a Thursday evening. This could be done in the cathedral or at several churches in accessible locations. That they pray vespers together. They have time for confessions. They uh, say mass and have an hour of adoration with some passages read from in sinu Yesu. And they share a simple meal together. Believe me, that would have an incredibly reformative effect. I want bishops, this is my dear little dream, the bishops will stand in front of their presbyter and say to their priests, if you intend to continue to be sexually active, come to me and resign, right? If you, if you are not sexually active and you don't intend to devote yourself to a life of chest celibacy, come to me and resign. We'll help you find employment. We will pay for job training or education, all right? Within reason, right? And an invitation to those priests who are struggling with chastity, but are repentant. They know that what they're doing is wrong, and they want to stop, and they want to be full-fledged priests. Say to them, all right, come to me, and we'll devise a program for you to learn to live chaste celibacy. We're not going to let you live alone anymore, all right? You're going to live with other priests, so you have accountability, right? You're going to join courage, right? You're going to go to, on an eight-day retreat with the Institute for Priestly Formation, and you're going to receive psychological counseling for collateral problems, and we're going to work with you so that you can live a life of chaste celibacy. There's other plans out there, but I'm gonna say what we need to do for our priests is to pray and fast and sacrifice, right? We have to pray. There are many good priests and bishops who have been living fidelity for decades and not received the support they should have had from the rest of their priests and sometimes from their bishops. They have led incredibly sacrificial lives. I've been dealing with a young priest who was being hit upon by his pastor. And he didn't know what to do. He didn't know what to do. My pastor is making passes at me. And um, you know, I said to him, well, <laughs> what would you have done before you were a priest? He said, I would have hit him. I said, I think that sounds good to me. Um, <laughs> of course, they don't want to hit a priest. They don't want to hit a fellow priest. But you know, he, he was scared. He was scared of what could happen to him. And he did report it, and he wasn't well supported. And I said to him, you know, I said, you laid down your life. You laid down in front of the uh, altar. And you said you were given your life for Jesus. I said, I'm sorry that this is the way that Jesus has asked you to, do, to lay down your life, is to fight this fight and stand up for what is good. And don't let this group um, harass you. And he's doing it. And he's doing it in a beautiful way. It just his, his priestly manhood has just surged. Um, so it can be done. And I've seen that with many other priests now. Homilies are incredible. So I hope I haven't depressed you too much, but I want you to know that those prayers are powerful. Uh, you think, oh, well, all I can do is pray. I want to say, I, nothing good in this world is accomplished without prayer. And the people that I know are doing things, um, they know that they can't do it without prayer, that other people's prayers, you find yourself needing something and it comes to you just when you need it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.